This is LCC Radio, WLNZ 89.7, here in Lansing, Michigan. Our two guests, we're switching gears now. We're going to be talking with Kirk Marison uh, from Foods for Living and also with Joan Nelson from the Allen Neighborhood Market and also the Allen Market Place. And um, talking about the changing food culture and the food scene here, um, there's lots of things going on. Every time I go down Grand River Avenue, I see Foods for Living on one side, right. and I now see the construction going on where almost directly across the street from where you are, we're going to see a Whole Foods going in. Uh, Kirk, we're also seeing, is that a Meyer Market Fresh going in where the, uh, over on Trowbridge, the Trowbridge ShopRite is going to become a Meyer. I think it's called Fresh Time. Fresh Time, right? Yeah, fresh, oh, Fresh Time. Fresh Time. Is yes. that funny yes. spelling time? Or? Yeah, Time. It's, I think it's a play on words. Yeah. It's a play on words. Well, Stan yeah. Freeberg once did, he had an ad agency called Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Thai Incorporated. Yeah, yes, right. yes, yes. So that's going to change the food scene around here. Why, why are these changes occurring now, and what is it going to mean? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, according to them, I mean, they had been doing market research. This is whole, well, we'll talk about Whole Foods All right. first, because actually I don't, the fresh time situation I really don't know a great deal about just because I think it's still undeveloped as far as conversation is concerned. You know, Goodrich has just went out of business and then they have to develop that entire space, which I'm not totally certain on I, I what, go what by the there. plans are. I, I, yeah, people keep telling me strange things about them re, refacing the actual building, whereas I was under the impression it was going to be raised. But anyway, we'll go back to Whole Foods. But it sure so, looks like they're rebuilding the front. Right. Oh, yeah, that's what they did. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I mean, I haven't been down there. And um, I heard the developer is now suggesting that he needs additional tax relief in order to complete the project. Yeah, so that kind of puts yeah, the, that, the city in a yeah, bind. Of course. Yes. So as far as the Whole Foods situation, they uh, were apparently doing market research for a number of years to make their way into this area and then, I guess, decided to jump. Um, we had known about it quite a while ago, maybe let's say a year and a half ago, they officially made the announcement in August of last year on their quarterlies, but we had known about it before that. And uh, I guess because of um, the bounce back in economy, you know, oh. you know, here, I mean, because there had been other larger uh, natural food store chains that had, um, had considered coming here, well, a Plum Market was going to come in, I think, 2007 or 2008. Okay. Oh. And then uh, I think once uh, General Motors went out of business, I think they made a choice to not bother to do that. Yeah. And so then I think it was just for, you know, a few years there, I think it was just so rocky, the environment, you know, economically, that um, they just decided to pass on it. And all of a sudden that just kind of happened. So my, my impression, like the information I'd heard, is that they were going <coughs> to go directly to Grand Rapids, which to me makes more sense. It did to me too. Uh, now, how long have they been in Ann Arbor? Oh boy, it's been it's, over twenty years. It's yeah. a long time. So, yeah, they it's have a long two locations. Time. Yeah, two right. locations. Because so yeah, there's two different. Yeah, so it's been yeah quite some time. And then of course they've got all of their, you know, the you know suburban Detroit locations. And then of course they built the one downtown, in East Market, like just what last year or the year no the year before that. So they're you know they're they're aggressively you know you know, popping these up when they can. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's that. But. Do they have a different model for different communities? In other words, do they sort of suss out the, the Boulder community likes this and the Ann Arbor community likes that and they have a, you know, a varied stock depending? Apparently they do. I didn't know this actually until they they did the Detroit store was um, there. They tried a new model apparently of, uh, I think, lower margin. Oh. And so just because whatever, the, it's, it's kind of, I think it's testy down there just because it's, well, it's downtown Detroit, so they wouldn't know kind of how to move into it with ease. So I think they, they tried, they're, they're trying, you know, there as a, as a market strategy to go, you know, a little easier on margin just because of their, you know, history of being very, very pricey. The nickname is Whole Paycheck. Totally, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and they've, they're, they're really, really, I think they've just launched an ad campaign apparently that was uh, during the World Series that, you know, they're really trying to uh, reformat people's perception of what, what they are or what they do and so you know their their angle is just it's it's really it's really quite extraordinary actually what they you know 
Just How are they positioning themselves? Who do they consider their their market? Obviously, I think they they're going for the East Lansing Okemos market with right. where they're positioning themselves. Right. Yeah. Educated, upscale, <clears throat> totally disposable income. Yeah. They want that's, organic. That's exactly it. Yeah. It's what they call they wine they, drinkers. Yep. They they label it simply as as um, premium foods. Like people, okay. like like basically people that would purchase premium foods, which is not everybody, mind you. I mean, actually, it's oh, yeah. not. It's not you know necessarily a you know a, a common thing. I still, it's, having worked at, at you know Foods for a Living for so long, it's amazing to me how many people I run into that just don't. They don't really have a perspective on what that means, no, or, or anything about it, which is totally fine. But you know, they're just like, oh, you know, in that you know, health food stuff, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, gosh, yeah, of course. Yeah. But of course, it's much you know broader than that, which I guess is what we're talking about. But uh, yeah, so anyway, that building is going up, and apparently, uh, it's going to be uh, July, June, July. I think is what their their target is to actually have it up and running. So, how does your niche differ from theirs, and who is your audience, and how would they be different? Or are you going for the same people? Well, we don't. We're not going for anything. We, we, we've, already, we've already been. Um, we have. We, so we have a. You know, we've got our our. You know, core. Uh, you know, customers who, which is so all over the map. It's not. It's not a. You know, we've never done market research to figure out who's what and what's what. We just sort of we. You know, we have, we exist and we do this thing and we. Uh, you know, try as hard as we can to, you know, do a great job of what we're doing there. And uh, I don't know, their their marketing is so, so faceted, you know, all over the place just because it's a corporation. Right. You know, whereas the, the you know, huge, huge difference between the, the us and them would be that, of course, they are, you know, they're a, they're a corporation that's moving into what they seek as an opportunity, which still to me, to give up my opinion, I don't know if, I don't know if it's, I, I just don't see it. Knowing what I know about the business that, you know, is available, you know. The customers you see, yeah. The cu customers yeah. that I see and like what I know about the co-op and as far yeah. as like actual dollars to be made uh, on that side of town, I just, I don't see where it's going, let's put it this way, I don't see where it's going to satisfy uh, a corporation's interest in um, what, what they call a successful business. So they'd have to create a lot new customer base absolutely which is totally possible maybe based on their maybe based on their their you know buzz. name and the buzz and that kind of thing but that usually that's fleeting you know it's like a lot of people want to go see what the new what the new you know theme park is and they'll go in and I'm sure it's going to be a beautiful store you know with, with it's going to be well appointed and all that and then you know we'll see what happens past then one thing I wanted to talk about, I think, is that, that even before they came into town, I mean, you've got natural foods, places like us, for instance, which I would call mid-level. Mid mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're independently owned. It's the only store we've got. We started from, you know, zero and made it to where we are now, which has been 17 years, right? Wow. So, I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah, 17 years. That's wow. I've been there 16 years. They've been, we've been, I've been there almost as long as it's been open. Yeah. And, um to watch it grow from a very very small space you know 5,000 square feet to the you know the much bigger place that we've got now um, and then to see the market uh, get diffused so greatly uh, over like um because you know bigger chains recognize you know money to be made let's let's take as a for instance uh, um, glu the gluten-free culture you know, as as it is, you know, which I'm sure you know about, right? Sure do. So there you go. So uh, gluten free, of course, obviously has become something that's become not just a sort of a, a niche, but has become very very mainstream. Where you go to a restaurant and it's got a gluten free aspect to the menu. It's not something that's kind of it's, that's freaky or you know. Yeah, it was very hard to do early it's on. Far, yeah, and we we were the first ones. And it happened very fast. Yeah, it happened main the mainstream. <coughs> yeah, the, main the booming of it. it. The booming of it. Yes. It did happen fast, I would agree with that, wow. but you know, we had been kind of, you know, working on that for a long, long time, kind of having, trying to find uh, whatever we could to supply that just because it was so difficult for people to, that had that dietary restriction to do it. So, and then you've got, you know, Meyer and Kroger and you've got Target. And you've got all these mass market um, Betty Crocker stores. now has a whole line of cake mixes. There you mixes go. Yeah, it. totally. You know, King Arthur, those those things that yes. are those, you know, kind of, you know, the things that are like went from fringe to not at all. 
So what I guess my point is I'm trying to make is that the, even the more mass market stores that are, have already existed for years, even before we came around, have now taken a big, big chunk out of that, that market and they're selling it cheap. You know, because they can, they've got the buying power to, you know, purchase a semi full of stuff from, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, vendor it might be, and then distribute it amongst all of their, you know, bazillion stores, right? And so you can buy, like, literally, there are some items that I could go to Meyer and purchase off the shelf as a customer, you know, you as well, or anybody in the room, uh, cheaper than I can buy it from my distributor. Right. So I can tell you, Bob's yeah. Red Mill. There you go, Bob's Red Mill. Uh, I mean, Bob, they started yeah. out by selling the hearty whole grain bread mix. That was too obscure. Sure. And they stopped, I, because I've actually talked to the people at Meyer about when they did or did not start offering certain products. But right. they have bargaining power because mm -hmm. of the large quantities that they buy in. So right. they can get a discount far beyond what, I mean, if I go to their website, I'm going to pay significantly more. But, you know, you have to pay significant. It's very strange. You could go yeah. there to Meyer, buy them out, and put them on your shelves and make money. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how I'd feel about that, but I could, I, could, I, could, I could do it. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering, you know, when they actually open their doors and do this thing that they're going to do, uh, whether it's not going to be a, a, a big letdown. We have, you know, extraordinary support from so many of our customers, um, ravenous people that are just yeah. really, just really kind of enraged about the location of this thing, which everybody just seems is a really cheap shot. Yeah. Nobody likes that. You know, it's like one of those, you know, I mean, when it, when it happens with like a, you know, a, a, a big hardware store and then another big hardware store pops in, it, it's different because those are both corporations that are, you know, located from completely different places out of town. Right. You know, nobody takes it personally. They're just like, oh, it's, you know, it's a hardware store and it's competitor <clears throat> right across the parking lot. But, you know, being that we know so many people that have, supported the store and made it become what it is and they watched it you know and they you know their kids have grown from little things to grown-ups and all this kind of stuff while it's while they've been shopping at the store they uh they're they're kind of furious about it yeah I mean, certainly more so than than i am just because i understand that it's just it's business and that those things are going to happen and you can't you know taking it personally is you know the, you know probably the worst thing that you could do because then you're just gonna you know we you watched you, the AOP you, do it. that in the, in the 50s. I grew up in the 50s, and okay. there was the you know the mom and pop store on the corner right. that you were tremendously loyal to. Then the A and P would come in and cut prices. They were using loss leaders on everything to drive right. mom and pop out. And the big difference, of course, was that in the old days it was that community feel. I mean, I remember when the grocery store was the place where you kept a tab. And you settled up every once in a while. And if your dad was laid off or if he got injured at the shop and he couldn't work for a couple of weeks, they kind of let the tab go for a while. And there was no interest on it. You just paid it when sure. you could. Which we have done for people, Isn't believe it or not. Really? I mean, it's still? like, yes, I mean, here it is. And it's like wow. we, we've helped people out that don't have the ability to, you know, it's, it's the, that, that's something we have done. See, that's a and different uh, atmosphere. It is. It's, 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 you know, knowing the customers and, and interacting with them and just knowing, you know, the names and all of this. And it might seem hokey, but it's really not. It's, 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 uh, it's more community than yes. any sort of, you know, by just saying, you know, community. It's actual, you know, knowing, you know, knowing who you're dealing with. What, um, I just drove by there yesterday, the day before, and noticed how far along they've come. And first thing I thought is, God, I don't want to drive here. The traffic is going to be so <laughs> oh. bad. Oh. <laughs> I mean, pulling in place to locate a high volume store. No. Awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not going to be able to make a turn against traffic or you're crazy. Right. You know, there's no business really in some ways more cutthroat than the grocery business. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, a grocery chain like Meyer is lucky to make 3% return on investment. Right. You know, news organizations, if they didn't get 20%, they weren't happy, you know. So, yeah. I mean, 3% is a very narrow margin. Yeah, certainly margin is an issue. And it's, uh, you have to keep your customers, that customers can be fickle. They have new needs, new things. I mean, as we saw gluten-free expand, mm -hmm. places had to change. Um, the corporate model is to be very cutthroat in bargaining with suppliers and with vendors, do a lot of analysis where you're taking a look at the return per square foot for every single placement within the store. It seems to me that a lot of time is spent doing that kind of analysis that you have to just more or less listen to your customers directly, don't you? I mean, it's not as corporately scientific and no, spreadsheets. There's no, there's no, there's no science to it at all. <laughs> ah, I mean, it's, it's, it's talking you know, to your whatever. customer. Yeah, it's talking to the customer. It's wow, whatever. What and, 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 you know, taking advice from, you know, the, the, 
you know the gentleman that you know started the store there's like this couple this great couple from, from Perry opened the store in you know 97 and uh, he was a third generation grocer you know his his grandfather owned a small general store in Perry and then he himself and his dad then owned a grocery store and he and his dad owned a grocery store together like small community grocery stores just like we're talking about and then eventually you know came back to you know Michigan and in started this thing up and you know did it from not pretty much nothing you know did it with an idea you know really this is LCC radio WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing Michigan I'd like to bring Joan into this because yes. it started me thinking one of the things you said uh, Joan do you think because we are a limited market right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. do you think that Whole Food because they are going to local source a lot of things are going to kind of pull from is there enough to meet their demand without hurting other people I mean because they can local source and probably pay a little bit higher so they're gonna hurt what's going on in markets and things like that farmers markets yeah right? I mean I, you know I don't know I don't know I mean all of that is a is kind of an open question I, you know I, I do wonder if uh, Foods for Living has taken any steps to weather a loss of some of your customer base you know and you mean a contingency plan yeah oh certainly yeah. And you're not going to share that. I'm not going to share it. Yeah. No. I mean, it's, well, it's, yeah, it's not, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> but it's very interesting to me because, Joan, with the farmer's market movement yeah. at the same time, people's attitudes about change, food have changed. Yeah, yeah. And I think when Whole Foods first capitalized on the sort of fresh, um, upscale, organic, organic. And organic premium, you know, I, I think, well, where I come in is with local. I'm really yeah. curious about who's carrying, which, which groceries are carrying locally grown and locally produced foods. And, and actually, we attended the summit at the Kellogg Center oh, last week. The interesting and definition about what local is, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, yeah. there were 150 yeah. people in wow. that room, you know, in the morning. And uh, we saw many of the farmers who vend at our market mm -hmm. and who are part of our exchange, our, our wholesale market, the 80 farmers on that. and. Uh, <laughs> And they were having serious, con and then in the afternoon, people had half-hour conversations uh, with this uh, s small army of Whole Foods representatives, and uh -huh. they were taking down a lot of information. And and uh, what do they it, consider local? I, you know, I I miss the you know most of the morning session. I came in for the afternoon because so that that's a number that varies all over. Yeah, it does, but it varies it varies amongst a whole lot of us. Great, great you know. lakes. Great, great oh, lakes. they say great lakes, right? Ohio. It's not it's not yeah. Michigan. When I when I say local, I'm talking regional. Well, Texas, Texas within, is really big. Within you know, so you got right to within seventy five yeah. within you know our 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 market draws uh, farmers within fifty miles of Lansing. The exchange about <coughs> seventy five miles from Lansing. So I'm really thinking of mid Michigan. Mm -hmm. But we the think room of Michigan is as blueberries, for example, but right. blueberries are over on the other side of the right. state and that's a so it also varies by crop. Right. But the place was packed with farmers, with local farmers, with regional farmers. Uh, and I I was curious about that because I'm uh, I'm you know, that's that's always an interest to me to find out how much, what percentage of the produce, for instance, that is on grocery store shelves is actually grown or produced by uh, local producers. So that's... It's very interesting to me because, I mean, that means that you're willing to sell wholesale, whereas if you were vending at a farmer's market, you would be selling retail. So some of the group may have decided that they are willing to make that shift. If they do, then they also become a potential supplier to you, I assume, if... That depends. <clears throat> We're, I mean, we kind of unfortunately phase ourselves out of that conversation in a lot of cases be with produce, as it applies to produce, because we made a choice when we first started carrying produce, which was 14 years ago, that we were going to be strictly certified organic. You know, uh -huh. so we've lost. We've lost some really, oh, sure. really great produce people that have decided to let their certification expire on principle uh -huh. because they didn't agree with what was going on with it just because we mm -hmm. we are we, we decided to go organic just to kind of go uphold that standard so there's stuff I'd love to carry which I know is clean as a whip probably even cleaner right. than the stuff that that is actually certified organic that yeah. we can't get mm -hmm. or we or we can get it we just are you know choosing your to. rules say that it's you, an expensive sure, and, right. and that certification is an expensive it process is, especially yeah. for a lot of small to medium-sized growers yeah. and 
We're really lucky to have yeah. formed a partnership and received funding from MDARD to work with farmers to move them in the direction of certification. And that's called transitional, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Okay. Well, there are there are several there are several possibilities right now, but okay. we're one of the things that we are doing is providing mini grants to local farmers who are interested mm -hmm. in uh, in moving in the direction of, of either certified organic or even simply having food safety audits done. Okay. They're so certified naturally grown too, which is farmers certifying each other as opposed to having the federal government do it. That's a looser program that some people do and don't like. One of the things that I've been concerned about is that the pressures with the federal government's mandates have led to things like you can no longer have a dog on the farm, you know, because there's a possibility the dog is going to get into the field. Uh, that isn't really where people are getting E. coli from, but that's what they're doing, and there's something wrong about that. Yes. Um, people who are the organic farmers that I know would, they'd have to do something if they told them they had to get rid of the family dog. And it would not, I mean, they couldn't possibly continue that way. No. Uh, there's some strange things happening. A lot of this has to do with the corporatization of organic food, which is an additional trend that I'm quite concerned about. I mean, a lot of what you're seeing is that nobody likes to find that frog in the bag of spinach. Mm -hmm. So they're busy draining all the ponds around the organic fields and putting in these buffer areas so that the, live, the wildlife doesn't get in. But you know, I'd put up with an occasional frog rather than to see the whole area drained. I think you're an exception. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. too bad. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm not happy with all the trends that are sure. taking place even in what, the organic yeah. What can I get at Whole Food that I can't get somewhere else? Oh. Well. And I've shopped them. Uh, man. Well, I think their main draw, that what attracts people to them would be their hot bar, their deli, uh, their yeah. basically the, the idea. Takeout. Yeah, totally. That that sort of that takeout. Then their own recipes, which I think they've they've really worked on for many, many years to a point where I think that's become it's become almost a you know, a restaurant. It's kind a, of a, a restaurant inside the actual. It's a restaurant in a place mm -hmm. where you go to socialize. Mm -hmm. That's what I've noticed in mm -hmm. Ann Arbor. Um, thirty year olds go there to mm -hmm. hang around. Totally. <clears throat> Yeah, so that that would be my one quick answer yeah, for you. Yeah, I was just curious. That, yeah, because I <coughs> anywhere, right? Which pretty much. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think that Doesn't when they first mm -hmm. when they first started out, it wasn't as easy, you know, because I think there were there were not as many places that could serve no. that kind of that kind of taste. But now I think they really do face. I wonder how they will keep evolving because I'm sure they will. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I think is interesting is that um, we have Whole Foods moving in directly across Grand River from Foods for Living right. and from Elfco, mm -hmm. and yet there is constant discussion about uh, the food deserts in Lansing. Right. The Absolutely. Fact that the, you know the fact that there are not uh, that there not, there is not a, a downtown grocery beyond the probably the city market, which I suppose functions as a bit, kind of a grocery for some people. Yeah. But it's uh, <clears throat> but we're. What we're seeing on the east side, uh, and it's a trend that I really like, is the development of very small uh, groceries. You know, mm -hmm. the Burt's Meats, for instance, that just moved in. Oh, um, did uh, that happen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. On, uh, been there many, on Marshall it's a cool, that's a cool and Marshall. It's yeah, been wonderful. There many times. Mm -hmm. It's on it's on Marshall in Michigan, and they are doing. They seem to be doing a really decent business. The East Side is a a neighborhood that kind of embraces anything new with food. In any case. Um, you know, and then there are several small groceries that uh, are, you know, that target a particular demographic group or a ethnic group. You know, they're, they're halal you know, yeah, groceries right. and, yes. and yeah. whatnot. So, yeah. and I like that. I I really appreciate these sort of neighborhood scale uh, groceries. Boutique, as, um, you know, level. right? Yeah. They're really boutiques, right? As opposed to a, a much larger uh, grocery. Be because we're getting a, um, we're getting, I guess. A Whole Food. Do you think Trader? I always call Trader it, Joe's. I already call it Trader Vicks, but <laughs> it drives my spouse crazy. Don't they follow them around? Yeah, <laughs> they they do. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's. Yeah, they, have you heard which, anything? What about? Well, I mean, they, they had original plans to move into the space that is now Hobby Lobby. Right. Post Post Farmer oh. Jack collapsing and moving out of that, and that was empty for a while, and it was a you know a done deal. Like we had already, you know, whatever made plans to, to cope with it, and then it just sort of dissolved. So they had already made plans, and this would have been before 2008 as well. So I think everything kind of changed. I think I this see. was prior to that, but I don't think that was part of. I think that it was. A, I don't know if it was a 
you know, a feud over the property or what, I really don't know what happened. But that was, the, the original intention was for Trader Joe's to come here quite a few years ago and it never happened. And Whole Foods, I think it was originally going to move out to Eastwood Town Center. Now that we're talking about location, which isn't, doesn't solve the food desert, you know, thing. I mean, that's still, that's out, you know, in the middle of nowhere too, but it would be, you know, either location would be probably okay for them. Whole Foods. That's so strange though because when you really do think about it you're absolutely right I was I just assume you know I'm, I'm gluten-free right I eat vegetarian and I, I just assume the whole world does which I find out very frequently is absolutely <laughs> yeah, not the no, case. Bill looks at me like I'm nuts all the yeah. time. You haven't been in a Whole Foods have you? They've got a yeah. meat counter that goes like yeah. a mile. I or know yeah. I went into one once out in Boulder and it gave me the creeps I just <laughs> I viewed it as some sort of elitist plot so I, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted no part of it and I mean it didn't seem to be my kind Kind of people, and I don't know who if there are enough to support. I'm so not they sure. Have I mean, to broaden their model. we can't compare Ann Arbor and. Well, no, no that, that's that's that that's a that's come conversation. Close. Right that's there. the clue. And if it if it, know. I think people's tastes are changing. I think mm -hmm. that when people are offered options and choices that are different from what has been traditionally offered, that. Um, they, well, you they, created a whole. Well, there's a, a whole food culture, culture on the east side. side. I mean, yeah, we, yeah. we we opened our winter market last Wednesday uh, from three to six thirty. And uh, had 316 people in there. Yeah, you know. So it's a, and these are many people who are, with, are within walking distance, you know, and who are looking for this, the same kind of experience that you described at Whole Foods. They want to meet their neighbors. They want to catch up on news. They want to. It's, it's a very social sort of thing, but they also really have come to appreciate what food that has been picked that morning tastes like. As opposed yes. to food that's been on a shelf for a few weeks or yes. been trucked 1,500 miles. You probably don't appreciate $8 blueberries, though, you know? No. Well, at a farmer's market where it's a direct sale from, you know, from yeah. farmer to consumer, it's... That doesn't you know, bother me as much if I know it's going into the farmer's no, pocket no, instead I mean, of... Yeah. Whole food, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the prices at farmer's markets are, I think, quite reasonable. They're comparable to Myers. Yeah, they are. You know, so it's... Uh, and it's fresh, and it's locally grown, and you're supporting the, you know... Local economy. Matt Burbeck of the uh, of the what is it called the Michigan something. It's the the food think tank over there at Michigan State. He was talking about the fact that by the time you get that broccoli in at Myers, it's probably mm -hmm. been seven to ten days on a refrigerated truck. Right. And what I find so often, if you do buy produce there, is that it is very close to just going bad. I mean, we're talking about you have a day margin or two. Whereas if you buy fresh local food, you put it in the refrigerator. It's like when I get nice stuff out of my hoop house. A week later, it's still fresh. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm the one that's going, right. you know, to, in the. I mean, I know it's losing some vitamins along the way, but average um, food what travels 1,500 miles to get to that grocery store yeah. shelf. You know, the, and the fact is that uh, EBT SNAP benefits actually yes. are uh, because they're accepted at many of the. Yeah, you know, there there are 26 farmers markets in Mid Michigan, and you know probably. Half a dozen at least now accept SNAP benefit and Project well, Fresh and Senior Project. Well, yes, EBT or Bridge Cards, and uh, and oh. more will. I mean, with MIFMA located just down the road, the Michigan Farmers Market Association, other other markets will, I think, pretty rapidly come on board. Do you see a share of that market as well, people? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. A I can't lot, see them as yeah. whole food customers. A lot with students as well. Uh. You know, students will will. I find that that's a, a common theme. That it's all just people just be coming up with you know a small thing of food and you know select items that they've just decided so that they can afford or choose to afford uh, you know of that nature and then that's that's how it goes I think it's great the Fair Food Network of Michigan uh, Orrin Hesterman's outfit out of Ann Arbor actually uh, developed the whole Double Up Food Bucks yes. uh, program. Some years ago, they they piloted it in uh, at Eastern Market and have since taken it around the state. We've been doing Double Up now for three years. What does that mean? Double Up is an amazing program where, it, where which involves people on food stamps on SNAP benefit, sliding their card through and being able to per to, to receive in tokens. Uh, double the amount of uh, on their card up to twenty dollars, so somebody can that they can use uh, yes, at the market. Yes, can you? Yeah, can slide their card through and uh, for ten dollars on their on their EB, their SNAP benefit card mm -hmm. and They'll receive twenty dollars worth, of, of, worth of coupons. So it doubles it. Who, it was subs who subsidizes it? Well, the Fair Food Network went around the state and we engaged we'll lots have of to, farmers markets. We'll have to get okay. you back to finish right. that yeah. off. This right. is we'll fascinating. Talk. We'll be it's back to talk next Monday night. This is Lansing Online News Radio. 
WLNZ 89.7 here in Lansing, Michigan. Thanks to Kurt Marison from Foods for Living and to Joan Nelson from the Allen Street Projects, all the food projects. See you next Monday night at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye.